You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. If we don't continue to fight for that, we're going to lose every possibility of living in a more secure, in a more protective environment without Big Brother, without big technology, knowing every single step that we take when we leave our homes, when we're sleeping, who we're talking to. We're going to get to the point where we're going to be fully exposed and there will be nothing left that we can do about it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat, the CyberWire's privacy surveillance law and policy podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Ben Yellen, from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hello, Ben. Hello, Dave. We are taking a bit of a departure from our usual format this week, and we're going to take a closer look at Apple's recent announcements that they will be enabling scanning for child sexual abuse materials on iOS devices. We're going to be spending the entire episode on this topic, and joining us is going to be our special guest, David Darajotis. He's Corporate Senior Vice President at Burns and Wilcox. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCorps Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. All right. So uh, as I said at the outset here, we're taking a little bit of a different approach to this week's show rather than go through our own individual stories. I think uh, this announcement from Apple warrants its own conversation. Uh, And before we dig in, Ben, of course, we want to welcome our special guest this week. Uh, Happy to have David Derajotis return. David, welcome. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Ben. Great to be here. Uh, David is a corporate senior vice president at Burns and Wilcox, and uh, we're happy to have him uh, with us. Uh, I want to start the conversation by saying that um, we're going to do our best this week to focus on the policy side of this issue. Um, I think a lot of other people have addressed the technical side of this, um, how the uh, the engineering, the encryption, you know, all of those things – that are going on behind the scenes. Um, and there are plenty of places to hear conversations about that side of things. Uh, we'll have some links to some other podcasts. Uh, the ATP podcast, the Ex- Accidental Tech podcast, did an excellent discussion. We'll have links to those in the show notes. 
Um, let me start off. Uh, let's just sort of do a, a little uh, taking the temperature here. Ben, why don't I start with you? Can you just give us a little bit of an overview of your understanding of what exactly is going on here? So Apple introduced two new programs uh, to monitor uh, sexually exploitive material uh, from children, so uh, people who are minors. The first one I have fewer civil liberties issues with. That is an algorithm that recognizes nude images in the iOS messaging application. It would uh, it, it requires a parent to opt in, uh, so it's not the default setting. And once a parent opts in, that parent, if that child uh, is under 13, would be notified if that child sends or receives a nude image. That doesn't present civil liberties concerns from my perspective because the parent is opting in. And we're talking about very young children here, and uh, it's obviously a very worthy policy goal to prevent child uh, exploitation. The other program that was announced certainly does present more significant civil liberties concerns, especially as we get into some of these more uh, slippery slope arguments about what might happen. Uh, As part of that program, Apple is monitoring photos that have been posted to the iCloud for images that match exploitative child pornography images that are in national databases like the one maintained by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. That program is going to be used uh, at the outset in the United States. It's going to be rolled out over the next uh, several months. And presumably, uh, if Apple finds a photo through their algorithm that matches a photo in that database, then law enforcement is going to be notified that could potentially lead to criminal prosecution. And I think that program is the one that's uh, causing Fourth Amendment advocates uh, and civil liberties group Uh, civil liberties groups the most concern. And the concern is that Apple has created a backdoor where if the government seeks to request information uh, and seeks to do so in a way uh, where they're not asking for a warrant issued by an impartial judicial magistrate, then Apple has created the technology where they can go into somebody's private photos and extract that information. I think that just strikes people the wrong way. It it cuts against our values of digital privacy. Hmm. David, when you heard uh, the news about this and and saw some of the initial reactions, what was your response? Uh, The concern is more overreach by large technology companies. There's already so much invasive uh, operations. You look at Facebook, you look at Google, and for the last several years, Apple has really built a reputation on privacy. I mean, if you look back to the 2015 San Bernardino shooting, the pressure that they received from the FBI to create that backdoor to get into the phone, to be able to bypass the the four-digit code at the time and get access to the content. So they received such pressure from the FBI, but they remain firm. So my question to Apple is what's changed since then? You, know, you see the, the advertising, the billboards that they put up, what happens on your phone stays on your phone. This is moving in the complete opposite direction. And while I think the, the spirit of it is well-intentioned, I think we can all band together and say that you know, explicit images with minors, children, that's something that's horrendous, despicable. Nobody wants to see that. But unfortunately, once you open up the door to this kind of access on private citizens' devices, there's no closing it, and it will only get wider going forward. Could the argument be made that Apple's response in the San Bernardino case gives them credibility here, that they they have demonstrated that they will resist uh, government pressure to to open things up? Ben, what do you think about that? I, I do think it perhaps gives them more credibility because that was the most high-profile case of the government not only exerting pressure on Apple through the courts, uh, but also in the court of public opinion, saying they're protecting information that might lead us to prosecute terrorists who killed, you know, 15 individuals in this horrific attack. Hmm. And Apple did stand strong, although eventually FBI was able to break their encryption anyway. Uh, mm-hmm. So the issue uh, did become moot. But I also think um, that's one of the reasons the backlash has been so swift, because it is Apple, because it is this this company that has presented itself as the foremost protector of private user data. I don't think the reaction would have been the same uh, if it had come from another provider just because Apple carries that sort of cachet as being mm. this company that presents itself 
as um, the utmost protector of our private information. So I think it goes both ways. They've earned credibility in the past, but just by making this decision, that cuts against their uh, their reputation as a company. And I think it might throw some of their past actions into question as well. Are they really as protective of uh, private information, of end-to-end in, uh, encryption as they've claimed to be over the past several years? You know, David, it seems like part of the uh, outrage here is the fact that Apple has chosen to do this on device rather than scanning images that are in the cloud, which is what many other providers are doing. Google does this. Facebook does this. Dropbox does this. So so that mm-hmm. is a routine, uncontroversial thing. But it seems like Apple did not expect the backlash of actually – doing the scanning on the device. what In your mind, what's the difference here? Well, I, I think there's a big difference. And Apple promises, they, they make promises that they won't bend the knee to government intervention, uh, requesting access to de- data that's on the phone, looking at photos and other content. But we also have to remember, Apple sells iPhones without FaceTime in Saudi Arabia because exactly. local regulation prohibits encrypted phone calls. Hmm. And if you look at one of the most stringent cybersecurity laws in the world and really most invasive, if you take China, for example, they have a couple of data centers that they opened in China because the law requires it. So Apple has been legally required to remove VPNs. They remove news, other apps uh, from the store because in China, the government needs access to that information and they require audits as well. So I think it's very difficult for Apple to uphold the promise that they will not give up information that's located on the device in the iCloud when we've already seen instances of them following regulations, being compliant with governments all over the world. Who's to say that this won't be next? And who's to say that the government won't ask for a little bit more as opposed to it just being right now, you know, sexually explicit material? I think that's a a great point, David, and I know this is cliche. We just had our uh, baseball game in the Iowa cornfields reflecting Field of Dreams, and the line (laughs) from that movie is, if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I I think that's unfortunately applicable here, is that once this technology is built— you can't absolutely assure users across, you know, the the— hundred some odd countries where Apple sells its products, that their information is going to be protected into perpetuity. Uh, because once this technology exists, it, it can be used not just to scan photos, but to scan other applications, to scan social media applications, although that's already, of course, public anyway, but to scan messaging applications, uh, to crack down on political dissidents, uh, or to foster mm-hmm. censorship. Uh, and as you've said, we've seen examples where they've bent the knee to more totalitarian countries who have made these requests because they want to continue to sell their devices in those countries. So once this technology exists, there are going to be governments across the world and not governments that are particularly friendly to civil liberties who want to exploit this technology for their own purposes. And it's going to be much harder for Apple to go to these authorities and say, we're not going to do that, when now these authorities are fully aware that Apple has um, the technological capabilities to do so. Hmm. You know, uh, child sexual abuse material is a special category. And uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, who heads up the, the database for this, they have a special status when it comes to this sort of thing. I mean, they are... It's my understanding they are the only organization in the U.S. who is allowed to um, to house these materials because they have to, you know, they have to have to in order to create the database, they have to do this. How does the fact that this is a this is a special category of crime um, play into this, if at all, Ben? So. From a legal perspective, the First Amendment does not protect child pornography. And that's a very, that's something that's very unique uh, for that area of the law. The First Amendment is protective of all types of lewd images, uh, even, you know, obscenities, uh, things that are offensive to most of our eyeballs. That is protected under our First Amendment. There is this carve out. Uh, that the Supreme Court has has reaffirmed over and over again that child pornography does not merit First Amendment protection. 
partially because it is its separate category uh, in that it's, it is extremely exploitative of children. It can have real-world effects. It's not theoretical. Uh, so I think we have to keep that perspective in mind, and that's why Apple is rolling out this technology in these circumstances to apply to this these exploitative images, is that we know that sexually exploitative images of children does carry this sort of extra weight. It falls outside areas of First Amendment protection in a way that all other types of speech, be it political speech, uh, personal expression, do not. So I, I do think it carries um, you know, some sort of extra meaning, not just uh, morally, but within our legal system as well. David, do you suppose that this adds a layer of anxiety to folks who are using iOS devices knowing that I mean there's a it, it's hard to imagine this is such a horrible crime that I think the possibility of being falsely accused of it uh, could cause anxiety for people and I, I'm, I'm not one who believes in an argument that you know if you if you're not doing anything wrong you have nothing to hide I mean you know that's I think runs counter to to many of the things in our constitution but I I can see you know, this is a new level of surveillance, and it's on your device. It's it's there, it's there all the time. If you're using iCloud photo services, it's there. That that's sort of the ball game. Yes, I completely agree, Dave. And look, Apple has been for the last countless years. They they've been a company that promotes privacy. They've been a company that's used their edge in this space to uh, gain a competitive advantage over the likes of Google, over the likes of Facebook. So they've been the one leading the privacy charge. And I think that the American public, we've just seen countless data breaches. We've seen constant issues of rogue employees, threat actors that are accessing our personal information. There's there's not a day that goes by where you don't see a new headline surrounding ransomware, you know, exposing sensitive and confidential medical information, whatever it may be. And Apple has really been the leader. They've been at the forefront of promoting privacy, of promoting keeping your information secure. So I think that there is a heightened level of anxiety because now you have big tech reaching directly onto your device in ways that I think a lot of people don't realize can happen. So what photos you have, the text messages you're sending, the contacts that you have, so many companies constantly scrape. They go after this information. They share it. And now we have another instance of a, a program. Again, it, in, it's in the, the best spirit that the intentions are, are very favorable in terms of stopping uh, the spread of this type of information, stopping the spread of sexually uh, explicit material as it relates to children. It, it's it's, in theory, a good idea, of course. But again, if somebody is wrongfully accused, if there's a threat actor internally, if there's a rogue employee, there are just so many ways for this to go sideways, for it to go wrong. And I think Apple has announced, they did say that there's, the number was astronomical. I think it was one in a trillion mm. um, that there would be no false positives or one in a trillion false positives. So it, it's very unlikely my concern here is, again, they are coming onto your device, onto your personal information. What's going to happen if somebody gets into Apple, if they're able to access information that they wouldn't have been able to access previously had it not been for this program? What if a rogue employee decides to do something that they shouldn't do if they're going to get some type of payoff from mm. a, a criminal? And then again, What's the next step from here? You know, as Ben mentioned, what 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 does this lead to? Once this door is opened, it can only get wider. You can't go backwards. Yeah, and as, as we're recording this, um, you know, this morning I saw on social media some folks in cybersecurity or there there are uh, GitHub projects underway where people are starting to experiment with creating adversarial images to to counter this, to confuse this, to you know. Uh, cloud this to make this more difficult. So, you know, that's a real issue as well. It's it's a possibility. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick break here. We're going to uh, pay some bills and let our uh, advertiser share their message with you. We'll be right back in just a moment. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. 
Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. And we are back. Uh, ben and I joined by our special guest, David Derajotis. He is a corporate senior vice president at Burns and Wilcox. Um, Apple has been very uh, specific and clear about the levels of technology they have put in place here um, to try to keep things on the straight and narrow when it comes to this. Um, Apple's uh, Craig Federici sat down with Joanna Stern from the Wall Street Journal. They had a, a good, what I'd describe as a clarifying conversation in response to a lot of the backlash. And one of the points that uh, Craig made was Apple, who has been accused of being late to the table with this sort of thing, as, as we mentioned earlier, you know, Facebook, Google, Dropbox, they've all been doing this sort of scanning for quite a while. And Apple has been lagging. And Apple has gotten pressure from folks in Congress that they needed to step up and do a better job. So part of this, I think part of the why now question might be that this is a response. So Apple, If Apple didn't do this themselves, they would have been forced to do something through legislation. So all that said, the technical steps that Apple has put in place are significant. Uh, Craig made the point that you know, you have to have 30 images uh, or so on your device before Apple even gets notified that there's an issue here. Um, there has to be this critical mass reached before Apple is even able to access any of the images. And, and only then uh, it, does a human intervene and view a low-res version of the images to verify that they are actually what the machines think that they are. So, what I'm getting at here is that it seems as though Apple, in good faith, tried to come at this problem from a technological point of view. It seems to me that Apple themselves are surprised at the amount of backlash that they are getting here. Um, ben, does that surprise you? It surprises me a little bit um, just because you'd think that Apple, the most privacy conscious of these companies, would understand why this would cause a backlash. I'm not surprised by the backlash just because I think it conforms with values that we have. Hmm. Um, you know, our Fourth Amendment jurisprudence in this country is built around this idea of reasonable expectation of privacy. If we display a subjective expectation of privacy by trying to keep our information, whether that's photos, messages, et cetera, to ourselves, and if that expectation is reasonable, then the government needs a warrant to obtain that information. I think even though you know that's a provision of the Constitution, it's also a, a fundamental value that if we seek to keep something private— um, then the government can't get access to it. Hmm. And so I think just the possibility, either whether it's through this or something like the Earn It Act, a piece of proposed legislation that would have compelled uh, companies like Apple to take a similar action, the concern is that we'd uh, it would be a, a very significant violation of that expectation of privacy. And I think that offends us on a, on a pretty deep moral level just because it's such a fundamental value uh, of our country. It's has to do with, you know, going back to our uh, English legal ancestors where you would have these general warrants where minions of, you know, the the ruling king or queen would come in and look for incriminating information in people's houses, mm -hmm. even if they, you know, didn't have any suspicion that somebody had done something wrong. And so I think our ears perk up a little bit when we hear something like this, where we know that Apple is going to be accessing our private digital space. Uh, so I, I, I just think based on our own political culture, you can understand why there was such a backlash. David, what are your thoughts on that? I, I agree with Ben there fully. I mean, again, how much information are we willing to give to these large technology companies that already encapsulate so much around the way that we live 
our lives. They, they already know our location. They already know the different apps that we're using, when we're using them, how long we're using them. They already know all of the contacts that are in our phone, you know, who we're corresponding with. So we're giving up inch by inch, sometimes mile by mile, as a matter of fact, bigger pieces of our private life. We're going to get to the point if, if there's no action taken and people aren't mindful. And I think this is why there has been such a backlash because people have become much more mindful of what it means to be private and to have that expectation of privacy. If we don't continue to fight for that, we're going to lose every possibility of living in a more secure, in a more protective environment without big brother, without big technology, knowing every single step that we take when we leave our homes, when we're sleeping, who we're talking to. You know, we're going to get to the point where we're going to be fully exposed and there will be nothing left that we can do about it. Hmm. Uh, it kind of strikes me that, um, you know, most of the intrusive uh, technological surveillance that we've been subjected to over the past several years has been more of the metadata variety. Uh, mm -hmm. You talk about contacts, you know, who we're messaging, what the duration of that message was, even something like historical cell site location information doesn't, you know, reveal our most private communications. So I think that's where this is uh, a very prominent step in that direction, is we're talking about content here. Uh, we're talking about the actual photos and the actual messages. Uh, so I think there really is a distinction in terms of the, the private information Apple has had access to in the past and the private information now that they have access to the content of our devices. What about the fact that this is all opt-in? I mean, you, in, in other words, Apple has said that if you're not using iCloud photo services, they're not even going to be scanning your photos. It effectively turns off the switch for any of this scanning to happen. The, the hashes for the images are going to be in the operating system. You know, that's going to be baked in now. But unless you turn on your iCloud functionality not, they're not even going to take a look at it. Um, and yet people don't seem to be calmed down by that. Why do you think that is, David? Well, again, I think it's the level of awareness that, that Apple has really created um, in their marketing strategy, in their campaigns, their focus on privacy. I, I do think that it is a positive and, and a great step that they're taking in terms of making sure that uh, the consumer has to specifically and explicitly opt in to this service. Mm. But again, we've seen a number of cases, not Apple, but we, we've seen cases throughout the years where companies make retroactive changes to the privacy notice, to the actions that they're taking, and they just automatically start collecting information or they're automatically opting people in um, to the various programs or data collection methods that the company employs. So this is where you as a consumer have to pay very close attention to the terms and conditions, to any future changes that could occur. Because right now it may be opt-in, but who's to say two years from now that doesn't change and you're automatically opted in when you do a, a software update for the newest Apple release. Those are things that people need to pay very close attention to because it can come back to bite you if, if you're not aware. You mean, David, you don't read all 200 pages of the terms and conditions when you uh, download yeah, that right. iOS update? I, I know. You know, being involved in the privacy space, I hate reading all of those terms and conditions and privacy notices. Yeah. I agree. Actually, I guess it's part of your job that sometimes you have to, right? You poor That's guy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, it also strikes me that as much as Apple has built a reputation on uh, supporting privacy as being, you know, the, the privacy company uh, among these big tech giants. They also have a reputation for uh, a certain amount of arrogance. You know, Apple Apple knows what's best for you, right? You don't, you know, when the I, iMac initially came out, you don't need that floppy drive anymore. You know, with the recent iPhones, you don't need that headphone jack anymore. Um, and... While I think that's largely worked out for Apple, certainly, you know, their products are selling well. They are, uh, <laughs> if not the, the among the most valuable companies in the world. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a case where that attitude, where they didn't float this publicly before they just un came out and announced it fully baked, right? They came out and said, this is what we're doing. It is a technological marvel uh, it's going to solve all of these problems, and and it's a done deal. 
uh, I think that attitude from Apple in this case isn't really serving them well. Do you agree with me, David? I agree. I mean, Apple has sold, they have over a billion iPhones in use today. The iCloud has over 850 million users across the world. They've built the reputation around user experience, around privacy. And I think anything that they do, any steps that they take that are contrary to that perception, to that uh, you know, kind of cachet that they've created, it's going to create outrage. And, and I think that's why we're seeing the backlash here, because they have built a reputation on protecting their consumers. They have built a reputation on going in the opposite direction that other large tech companies have, have chosen to take. Apple's on a different path. And again, the question I would ask, what's changed now from your stance in 2015, 2016, when you were willing to put up that fight, when you were not willing to turn over the contents of the phone and not willing to create that, that back door to break the encryption? Because then it was about privacy. And Apple stated, if we make these changes, if we create that back door, privacy will be lost going forward for everyone. So yeah. now that they're taking this new step, I, the question I ask is, what's changed since 2015? Yeah, and I, I think it's worth you know just mentioning as a point of of clarification that um, Apple has Apple does not encrypt your iCloud backups, and that has been a way for law enforcement to uh, you know get at information that people had stored on their phones. It's mm -hmm. also benefited Apple because it gives them the ability to help people restore their phones. If a phone's been locked or broken or lost, you know, they can, they can get at those backups uh, that they otherwise wouldn't. But, you know, in the past, uh, Apple has made noises that they were going to start encrypting that, and they've got pushback from folks like the FBI, uh, and they've, they haven't done it so far. Um, ben, I, I'm curious, you know, we, we hear stories about these tech companies receiving uh, demands from the government to turnover information. And part of that demand includes not being allowed to tell anyone that the demand was made. Right. A gag order. Yeah. Yep. Um, is that coming into play here? Is, is the specter of that hanging over this as well? Absolutely. In a bunch of different circumstances, when the government requests information, those requests come with a gag order. And depending on the circumstance, especially if it has to do with something national security related, uh, it might be really hard to even seek judicial review uh, to reveal information uh, that's part of that gag order. And that could be very dangerous for the public because Apple is, in a sense, muzzled. They're not able to to share the type of uh, request that that they've been given, you know, whether it's been informal or whether it's been a, an official subpoena. Um, and, you know, that can certainly impact public debate on this. If Apple is receiving a bunch of these requests, but they're bound by gag orders, how are we to know as the public uh, exactly what Apple is asking for and exactly what they are receiving? Um, and that really does depend on the context of the information that's being sought. But it's certainly an issue that's in play here. Hmm. David, in your mind, uh, where where could Apple go from here? Is could is there a way that they could uh, they could salvage this situation? You know, I think for true privacy advocates, there, there's no turning back for Apple at this point. I don't know if there's any salvaging the, the messaging that's already gone out, the steps that they're taking. They're they're not launching this update until the end of this year, and it's going to be in the U.S. United States only. So I think it can only snowball and become more of a privacy nightmare going forward as they introduce this in other countries, as they roll it out in other places across the world. You know, my worry is what's going to happen for the citizens in those countries? What's going to happen for us here in the United States years down the line? Because again, they are taking, as it, as it appears, very strong security measures, the hashing methods that they're doing on the phone, matching them back to the uh, you know, NCMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They're, they're doing it in a private manner, in a, in a way that makes sense. My, my fear is, is, what's the next version of this going to look like for citizens in China and Saudi Arabia? What's going to happen for the citizens when the government says, well, we want to now see uh, different types of communications, whether it's political, whether it's religious? What's going to happen when they start matching hashes to those types of conversations and those types of images. 
that are being communicated and shared between the citizens. I don't think there's any going back from here. It's only going to get broader and wider in the years to come. A question for for either of you. I mean, does do do the service providers themselves, the Apples, the Googles, the Facebooks of the world, are, do they have liability for potentially having these images on their servers? Is this are they protected by say, you know, section 230 of the Communications Decency Act or are they obligated to look for and scrub and report these sorts of images? Well, Ben, maybe I can jump in here for for part of this. Section 230 is not all-encompassing. There are some exceptions to what's covered. Federal criminal liability, uh, electronic privacy, intellectual property claims. So I think any type of information that an organization collects, stores, no matter how sensitive, you can look at the most sensitive medical information uh, procedures, uh, billing information that that are stored and, and collected on individuals. You can look at social security numbers. If they're choosing to store very sensitive, uh, critical data on consumers, it's their obligation to protect it and to store it securely because they're the ultimate data owner. They are the ones that have this information um, within their network. They need to protect that data as well. So I don't see a scenario where they will be protected from any type of liability. The more information they collect, it only increases the liability that they have for the consumers uh, that they service. Yeah, that's my, that's my read of the situation uh, as well. Um, it also is the Communications Decency Act uh, that we're talking about. So the intention of that act was to limit the exposure of offensive content to children. I mean, hmm. Section 230 mm-hmm. is one part of that law. But, um, you know, uh, they, I think while there is a general shield of liability for uh, images or content posted on these third-party networks, it, 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 as David says, it's not all-encompassing. Yeah. Uh, and there are ways in which they can be held liable. Mm. All right. Well, so final word, Ben. Let, let, me, let me give it to you. I mean, suppose Apple came at this and said, you know what uh, – we're going to reconsider this. We're going to come at this the same way that some of our colleagues have. We're just going to – we're simply going to scan things on our cloud servers. Uh, we're not going to uh, do this on your actual device. Do you think that would put them in the clear? Would people be okay with that? I kind of agree with David that the cat's already out of the bag. You can't uh, you know, stuff this back in just because they have already decided to make the decision to go into people's devices. Now we know, A, that they're willing uh, to engage in such a step, you know, even if they were to retract under a severe public backlash, and B, that the technological capability exists. So even if they were to retract um, these particular programs, we know that they have the technological capability, and if they were ever sufficiently pressured, whether it's by our government or by Saudi Arabia or by China— into making use of this technology, that the technology exists. Uh, and it's now all on the record that this is something that they've uh, developed and are willing to use. You know, I, I think we can surmise that this effort is the result of political pressure because members of Congress, you know, as evidenced by the proposed uh, legislation of the Earn Act, think that tech companies have not done enough to protect against childhood exploitation. So in a sense... This announcement is a reaction to public pressure, which means what's to stop them from similarly reacting to public pressure in the future, whether it's in this country or a country that that cares even less about civil rights and civil liberties. So I think it would be really hard uh, for them to fully undo what they have already done uh, by making this announcement. David, your final thoughts? I agree with Ben 100% on that. And I think this is just a reminder, if if we truly want to obtain personal privacy and protection, we cannot give so much power to any one technology organization, any one company in general. It's important to segment your digital life. Having all of the information on, you know, like your Apple device, having all of the communications, the phone calls that you're making, contacts, photos, it puts you at risk and, and you're really at the mercy of that company, no matter how strong of a privacy reputation they want to promote. So I think that the biggest learning lesson from all of this is segment your exposure. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket and make sure you're mindful of how the company operates, what they're collecting and who they're sharing that information with. All right. Well, gentlemen, uh, a good conversation on, on a difficult issue. Uh, 
Thanks to you, uh, David Derajotis, a Corporate Senior Vice President at Burns & Wilcox. Thank you uh, so much for taking the time to join us today. Dave, it was my pleasure. Thank you, and thank you, Ben. Thank you, David. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. The Caveat Podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening.